um, around seven at the time, and I remember being swinging on the swing in my little garden in um, suburban Dunedin, and I remember the neighbour coming in um, in quite a flat to talk to my mother and say, you know, Diana's just died. My mum's own reaction was kind of ingrained in my memory there, but it's quite fascinating in that when in some of my own research, which is focused on responses to the Christchurch mosque attack, I was speaking to people who had experienced that as a similar moment of, you know, where were you when it happened? Um, but even some of the much younger people there who weren't alive when Diana died um, referred back to Diana as a similar example of um, these kind of world-changing moments. So it has had this kind of, you know, outstanding significance that's carried on since. And you say in, in your article that you wrote on Newsroom that if she died today, it would be different because of the power of social media. Yes, I think that's one factor we can think about. Um, there were only about 10% of households in Britain at the time that had the internet, and that was you know, a different version of the internet pre-social media when Diana died. So that just wasn't really a factor in how people received the news, how people organised their responses, um, or what type of responses they were able to make to the use of this important public figure. Um, whereas today, the patterns that we see in other forms of memorialisation and the type of thing that I study um, is that social media is very heavily involved in how people get news about happenings like that and how they organise their responses. Um, and then it also becomes not just a kind of vehicle for people to plan a response that is, you know, based in a physical location. People actually do their memorial activities online, as well as, or as said, of um, going to a physical memorial. Is it as meaningful, though? Well, it's always interesting to think about that, because so many people critique social media as a kind of shallow vision of response. But certainly in my own research, it's not shallow at all. It would be dangerous enough really to kind of brush it aside as something that's less than. I think we can do both and acknowledge that social media has some limitations and some kind of performative qualities to it, but at the same time those things can be part of communicating to each other about what matters to us and the, the accumulation of all the little actions that people can take, which might be small actions, but that are visible in this really public way when you put them online, that can really accumulate into a bigger social conversation and you know, bigger modes of change even, especially when we are thinking about responses to death that might have a political component to them. Yeah, but you, you know, you talked about these interactions, the social media interactions, you know, some people might see them as shallow or trendy, creating some sort of yeah, popular morning or pop morning, but then there's something like Black Lives Matter, where social media has played a huge role. What started as a hashtag in 2013 went from trending on social media to becoming one of the largest movements in American history. When 17-year-old Trayvon Martin died at the hands of George Zimmerman in 2012, protests sprang up around the country, demanding everything from changes to Florida's senior brown laws to gun control. Organisers of the Black Lives Matter protests in New Zealand are calling on the government to condemn police violence in the US and disarm the police in New Zealand. We're seeing social media as something.